Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, sponsored PCR London Valves program. Um, the session is sponsored by Boston Scientific and is dealing with optimizing immediate and long-term outcomes after TAVI. My name is Mohamed Abdel Wahab from Germany. I'm joined here by Lars Sondergaard, my co-moderator from Denmark, and we have a lovely and very uh, experienced panel here. So as you can see here, the objectives of the session would be to understand the impact of permanent pacemaker rates and paraviral leaks on outcomes after TAVI in the current um, era, to appreciate the potential importance of neocommercial alignment, and also to discuss the role of cerebral embolic protection during TAVI. So three different but important topics that impact both procedural and long-term outcomes after performing TAVI uh, in the current patient population we are treating. Lars? Yeah, and also, Mohamed, we want the session to be as interactive as possible. So please, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, go to the microphone or use the app to, to post questions to us, and we'll try to address it and include it in this discussion. Yes. Um, so we'll start with the first uh, presenter. Um, Dr. Uh, Rasha Al-Bawardi will be giving you an update on permanent pacing and paraviral gestation after Tavi. Rasha, please. Thank you, Professor Abdulhab. Um, so it's my pleasure in the next five minutes to talk about paravalvial leak and um, pacemaker rates with accurate NEO. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about lifetime management, we talk about post-procedural um, effects that could affect their lifetime, such as paravalvial leak and conduction disturbances requiring pacemaker. And we also talk about more longer term um, effects, such as durability and the need for coronary access. So why do we care about the first two, which will be the, uh, the focus of the, uh, the next five minutes? What we know with paravalvial leak, there's definitely lots of data that shows moderate to severe PVL increases mortality. And there's also quite a bit of a concern uh, recently, even with mild paravalvular leak, that may maybe it's not as benign as we think. Uh, when it comes to pacemaker um, uh, needs, we also know that there's a lot of data that shows, one, it definitely impacts the LV function, it increases length of stay and cost of procedures, and as well as increased mortality in those patients in the David trial that required more than 40% pacing. Um, so when we talk about the accurate NEO uh, devices and how it tackles paravalvular leak, that one of the major concerns with the previous uh, device is that there is actually quite more than expected paravalvular leak. And to tackle this problem, what, we, uh, what uh, Boston Scientific did with the newer device, I don't know if you can see the the marker here, but what they did is that with the outer skirt, they extended it up. So it's longer, but it also has the active seal, which you can see here on the pointer. So you can actually see that if you have significant calcium on the side, this will help seal it, and you have lower rates of paravalvular leak. Uh, so what's the data showing with the Accurate Neo 2? This is one of the first registries, that, or first uh, group that looked at Accurate Neo 2 with 120 patients. And as you can see here, there are no severe paravalvular leak in the cohort at 30 days and one year. And the moderate to severe was only about 2.5 to 2.7%. Uh, now this has been replicated in multiple registries. This is a registry that looked at both Accurate Neo and Accurate Neo 2. And what you can see with propensity score matching that the moderate to severe PVL was only about 3.5% in the Accurate Neo 2 group, where it was more than 11% in the previous Accurate Neo. Uh, same data, data has been replicated in multiple other registries. Um, these are two main registries that looked at both uh, Accurate Neo and Accurate Neo 2. And as you can see, the moderate to severe PVL was down to 2% in the first group and also in the, um, the Italian registry as well. Uh, so what about Accurate Neo 2 compared to other valves? Um, these are two data from registries of both Sapien and Evolute Pro, which also so shows similar trend that the uh, no significant severe PBL in both groups and the moderate is comparable to other valves. Uh, when it comes to pacemaker rates, one uh, interesting thing with the se these self-expandable valve is that they're coming with, with single digits um, pacemaker rates. This is a data, a cumulative data of more than 1,800 patients, um, and you can see that the pacemaker rates ranges between 6 and 8 percent. And what we actually saw just recently, two days ago, that was um, released the uh, post-market clinical follow-up, which also which included larger patients of about 250, and the pacemaker rates remained low at 6. percent 
6.5%. Uh, and lastly, when it comes to comparison, this is data from registries that compared the two self-expandable valves. And you can see that the, uh, um, the pacemaker rates are still low with the NeoPro 2 valves, uh, although one can argue that this data also included Evolute Pro before the uh, cusp overlap. But you can see the consistency of low rates of pacemaker with the accurate Neo. So with that, I conclude my slides. Yeah, thank you, Rasha. We will, uh, we will move with a, with a short presentation on another important topic in this context. Marco Barbanti will be um, giving you an update on NEO commercial alignment, why and when. And then we'll take uh, both topics uh, and move forward to the discussion. Marco. So thank you very much. OK, microphone on. So, um, we had a lot of ado on the problem on the commission alignment and typing lately. So why this is important? We have some uh, issues, current issues, and very practical issues that rise up concern in, in today's practice. There are some uh, additional potential issues that could impact long-term, for example, durability, and also um, uh, long-term performances uh, of uh, transcutter valve and coronary flow. But the more practical and current problems for commercial alignment is, first of all, the coronary access to the coronaries. So coronary access uh, is an issue because we know that a lot of patients affected by severe arterial stenosis have some kind of coronary disease. And we know that um, PCI and coronary angiogram should, could be performed in those patients. We know that coronary disease can evolve in these patients, particularly in younger patients. And we know that um, particularly in patients who had already a coronary artery disease before TAVI, those patients have a much more uh, chance to undergo unplanned PCI CI after transcalty valve implantation. And we know that um, putting a valve in is, not, is, a, is a big deal, and it's a big deal for coronaries. But we show that it's not just what type of valve we're implanting, but also how we implant and how we size these valves. And the reaccess to studies show that actually we can do something to prevent the risk of uh, obtaining any problems to the access to the coronaries. Um, for example, in this study, we showed that the presence of Evolute was associated with increased risk of uh, um, coronary impairment and uh, coronary access after TAVI, as well as uh, a very high implantation death. We can do something, and we can do commercial alignment. This is another study, more recent, and which show very briefly that when we are able to obtain a good commercial alignment, we are able to increase remarkably the chance of having an effective um, um, coronary cannulation after transcalty valve implantation. But very briefly, what are the main characteristics that TAVI must have for obtaining a good commercial alignment? I think the first one is to have a clear and visible fluoroscopy markers before THV implantation. The second one is to have a highly flexible delivery system. And ideally, is to have a delivery system which has a one-to-one -one torquing capability, which allows us to provide a much more predictable commercial alignment. We know that all transcatered valves that are most frequent used Supraannual self-expanding valves have some markers. Some of them are very visible, some of them are less visible. But what is important to say is that these markers are visible when the valve is scrimped. So we can do commercial alignment in a quite nice way. And the last group showed very nicely that commercial alignment with the current devices, that once again, I remind you that they were not designed to obtain commercial alignment to adjust the orientation of the cusp. But actually, this is feasible. And there are some valves in which this kind of technique, so commercial alignment, is much more um, predictable and much more uh, effective, such as in uh, uh, with uh, Evolute and uh, Accurate Neo, particularly with Accurate Neo. And we can see here that uh, um, according to the two most common self-expanding device, supranal device, we have some kind of difference. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see the incidence of uh, severe commissural misalignment with Evolute when you put the flash port at 3 o'clock, which still is quite high, 20%. Of course, probably this is going to be improved. But the current device, this is what we saw. But with the accurate new device, with a new technique by implanting a safety pin, the, the delivery system with safety pin at 6 o'clock, by doing some additional maneuver, we'll see 
the uh, incidence of uh, uh, moderate severe misalignment, commission misalignment is very low. And once again, just to wrap up with the accurate, it's quite simple to do commission alignment. First step by putting this, like, the safety pin at six o'clock and then assess orientation using three Casper review. And you can see here, according to the presence of the post, we can go deeper on this, on the, the technique, and then obtain a commercial alignment and then implant the valve in a quite safe way. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Marco. So, so let's open up the discussion. Lars, are there burning questions from the participants? Um, no, there's no question for the right now, so let's see if we can... So let, let me first um, go back to, to Russia's... Um, part about AR and pacemakers. So Russia, we all know for a long period of time now that moderate or more AR is bad and it's prognostically relevant. And thankfully, with the majority of devices, we currently have extremely low rates. But we still have mild paravalve leaks. Even now with the modern devices, somewhere between 20 and even 35%. Um, does this matter as well for patients along their lifetime management journey? What's, what's your thought about that? Yeah, very excellent question is that we sort of ignored mild pyravi leak, as you said, but there's definitely emerging data that it's actually more concerning than we think. Uh, there's a meta-analysis published by Pompeo in uh, Structural Heart just this year. And what they did is that they it's actually looked at more than 25,000 patients, and they found that, yes, moderate to severe increases uh, the risk of mortality compared to mild and none, but they also looked at mild versus none or trace, and they found also a signal for higher mortality with a hazard ratio of 1.35. So definitely it's not as benign. There's another data also, it's a registry data that shows also with mild pyrovalvulin there's an increase. We don't know if it's an association, it hints about something else um, with that patient, but I think it's something we look at. What we know is with the post-market um, trial is that uh, the, the mild pyrovalvulin is actually lower than what we saw, so it's 18.9%. So we're doing better at least with this device in the future, but we definitely need to pay attention to mild as well. Yeah. Mark, could Maybe you? I can just follow up yeah. on that question, Russia, because uh, we have seen with device iterations, with these ceiling skirts, better pre-dilatation, post-dilatation, that the rate of PVL have come down significantly during the last couple of years. Who are the patients who are still at risk for PVL after a tower procedure? So, as you said, preparation definitely is the key. So, mild, um, so pre dilation with this device, maybe it helps as well with the PVL. Uh, there is a risk that with calcified, definitely calcified valves, that you, you get that mild pervalvular leak. What we saw with the newer device is that they actually, uh, the, the decrease in PVL was more with the calcified vessels than not, the calcified leaflets than not. Um, so, we still look at the calcium as one of the predictors with, with the PVL, but we, there's a lot that we don't know yet about these patients in the future as well. Marco, do you think we will uh, reach like surgical-like results with extreme, like with single-digit mild PVR, PVL rates anytime in the future? Do we need to have this as a goal, as a therapeutic target? Well, probably it's unpopular. Probably we won't reach in terms of leak the results of uh, the surgeon. I wonder if, uh, you know, there are some suggesting data that probably mild leak might have an impact. We have to the, it depends what patient. We have patient in which this mild leak might not have an impact. There might be patients in which mild leak might have an impact. So it depends uh, um, on this. I think we won't never get the surgical because still it's completely different. Um, I think, um, to be honest, that mild leak in the vast majority of patients, it won't be a big deal. Um, but this is just my personal feeling. But for sure, we have to definitely look for the reduction as low as we can, the incidence of leak, that's for C sure. Can I just follow up on that uh, answer, if it's okay, Mohammed? Yeah, so, so you, you just showed uh, the benefit of having commercial alignment of these valves, we're doing to have better coronary access, but you also mentioned that pavelva leak may potentially be less because the way this active ceiling skirt is located. Do, do you think that would be a way forward to get even lower? Yeah, to have think, commercial alignment? I, I think commercial alignment might play a role in long-term durability. Um, we don't know, actually. But also often the PVL. And also for PVL. We have a very preliminary data that we, with, by obtaining good commercial alignment, we have a reduction in terms of intra 
prosthetic leak. Um, I, I, I think they might play a role also in the hydrodynamic into the Arctic route to have a good commission alignment. We might have uh, an important impact also in PVL. And I think this um, is probably one of the factors in which all the, the very recent observations so with different valves, we, we've seen really the, the degree of uh, PVL coming, the, of also mild, coming down also with self-expanding devices. Uh, Phil, I mean, w in the past we used to understand that PVL and pacemakers are actually, if you want to uh, improve PVL, you have to increase pacemakers and vice versa. It doesn't appear to be like that with the accurate platform. Any, any personal opinion about, about this particular point of no, I think it's a question of tailoring the valve to the individual anatomy now. We're all very good at reconstructing valves on the CT with, with extremely good 3D imaging. And I think you have to tailor not only the valve type, but also the valve size. We're getting better at sizing these valves. Um, but, you know, any degree of PVL is, is unacceptable. I think we should all agree that it, we've got to eradicate this. And, and I think the pacing issue... Uh, is, is also that how the valve is deployed as well as, as well as what type of valve and the size of the valve. It's, you know, there's interesting data about uh, high valve deployments and new techniques of deploying valves which will reduce pacing rate. But again, you know, we're coming down into intermediate and low-risk patients and a, and a pacemaker is not a good outcome for those patients. But, but is it, Ignacio, like that with the accurate platform? Should we also aim at implanting at a high position? I mean, or should we just stick to the rules yeah. and implant it at five to seven and it doesn't matter a lot regarding yeah. Uh, pacemakers? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Because, because of the design of the Acuri Neo 2, the radial force is not the same in the distal part that in the proximal part. So our aim should be five to seven millimeter because it has been already prove that in this position we get less PBL and less pacemaker rate. So I think that because of that, uh, as uh, answering your first your question to, to Phil, maybe this design makes a big difference because you can get low pacemaker rate and also low PBL rate. And probably it's because of the design of the device itself. Yeah. Marco, getting back to the commercial alignment um, uh, topic, uh, What's your appreciation? I mean, we, it's more or less standardized now in the last two years, particularly with this device. We know how to do it. What's your feeling on how the community is adapting this in everyday clinical practice? Are the majority doing this? And, and for those who are not doing this, what are the limitations? Well, I think we have to, we have to be uh, clear that we have, at the moment, to the diff different types of operators. We have uh, very uh, key opinion leaders, very operators in very large centers in which I think this kind of technique is widely adopted, is now standard. On the other hand, we have uh, small volume operators which still um, have the first time in putting a valve in a good position to obtain uh, very low rates of PVL, to obtain a safe procedure. So probably we want to be focused on the effectiveness of the acute heart cancer procedure. So I think uh, this is up to us, try to um, communicate how this is uh, feasible and also is not um, very, um, uh, it doesn't not require a lot high level of uh, expertise yeah. and uh, it can be done, but of course, um, uh, I think it's important to underline, to give the message, pass the message. The first thing is to put the valve in the right position and do the best thing. So if you are not confident in obtaining perfect commercial alignment, you are starting it, uh, I think it's better to focus, it. particularly you have very bad tortuous anatomy, sometimes it may be difficult to obtain commercial yeah, alignment. Uh, focus uh, on the results of the, of the yeah. There's procedure. a few questions here, maybe one first one for you, Marco. If you do a valve and valve procedure, you have a failed surgical bibrostatic aortic valve, should you also aim for commercial alignment with your TAVI valve? Uh, I think it's uh, absolutely, we, we should. Yeah. We should, and um, sometimes it may be even easier because it, it depends what type of valve you are treating, yeah. but also in terms of fluoroscopic um, markers with many valves, the vast majority of valves, we have a very clear markers with the posts. So even finding the, um, the, the position, the perfect alignment, it's much, sometimes might be easier rather than uh, tricuspid. And, and maybe more valve. important with valve and, and valve as even well. More, even yeah. more important because basilica and because uh, yeah. many aspects that we can discuss, I don't know where Ignatius, if you do pre-dilatation for this valve, w how should you choose the valve, the balloon size, 
going looking for the minor axis of the aortic annulus or the perimeter derived diameter? Uh, I think that we should pick using the minimum diameter that or one minus that. So uh, I agree that we need to have a good pre-dilatation. This is a one-shot implant, so I really feel that we need to prepare the valve to get the best result that we can. Okay, so, so to sum up maybe this initial part of the session, uh, we are talking a lot about lifetime management, and this is important when we're treating patients, as Lars says, with longer life expectancy, but it all starts with a perfect procedure. So we need still to pay attention to obtaining um, good immediate outcomes regarding sealing, low pacemaker rates, and optimally, if the patient has a long journey, maintaining the options for the future, maintaining options for coronary access, and maybe for redo interventions. So let's move to a second important topic um, um, as well. Um, you all know that stroke is a devastating complication during TAVI. Um, and Phil McCarthy will tell us a little bit about stroke prevention methods and the data we currently have. Phil. Thank you for asking me to talk about this uh, topical subject. Here are my conflicts. So, so it's fair to say that stroke is a complication that we all dread and our patients dread it. We've all been told by our patients they would prefer to die than have a stroke. And never mind the disability that stroke causes, some studies have shown an increase in mortality of up to five-fold with this devastating complication. We've known for more than a decade that we shower our patients' brains with debris when we implant a TAVI valve, and this is one of the early imaging studies showing the really scary MRI uh, brain images before and after a standard TAVI procedure. The devices that are designed to prevent this, the cerebral um, protection devices, catch debris in nearly all cases. And the right-hand side here um, shows data from the Sentinel trial uh, that debris was caught in nearly all of the devices, nearly all of the patients. However, it, it's been a difficult evidence base uh, over the years, and, and most of the studies up until recently have concentrated on imaging endpoints. Some of these studies include the Deflect 3 study, which uses the TriGuard device, and the rest of them uh, listed here use the Sentinel device, which we're going to concentrate on. And it, it's probably also fair to say that there haven't been any decisive or convincing data from these studies, and the largest of these was the Sentinel trial, which did not meet its imaging endpoint. There have been some conclusions drawn about clinical endpoints, but none of these studies have been powered for clinical endpoints. So what goes on in the real world? Well, this is one very large uh, real-world uh, database, the TVT registry. The interesting thing about this is that 13% of TAVI procedures at the end of 2019 used a sentinel cerebral protection device, despite the lack of a convincing evidence base. And this study showed that there was not a significant reduction in stroke and the meaningful clinical endpoint in those patients receiving a sentinel. One of the conclusions of that, that uh, evidence uh, base, that real-world database, was that large, adequately powered studies, randomized studies, were needed. And the first of these, as you all know, was presented in September at TCT, the Protected TAVA study, which randomized 3,000 patients to receive either a Sentinel or no Sentinel. And you also probably all know that the clinical endpoint of stroke at 72 hours or discharge, whichever came first, was not met. There was no significant reduction in this endpoint. Although a secondary endpoint of disabling stroke was shown to be significantly reduced. Now, unfortunately, the table shown here, uh, I can't use this pointer, but the table shown here uh, shows some of the subgroups that were analyzed in this study. And they were too small to really draw any meaningful conclusions and actually gave rather misleading data about bicuspids and heavily calcified valves not benefiting, which is not what we would have thought. But if we drill down further into the protected TAVA uh, data, we can see that if you look at the patients on the right-hand side, I'll just point these out, uh, here, these are disabling strokes. 
And if you look at the numbers, there is a significant reduction in ischemic stroke, which makes sense. You'd expect the patients uh, receiving the Sentinel to have a reduction in ischemic stroke. But then you look at this data here. If I go there, whoops, if I go back. This shows that there was a reduction in ischemic stroke and disabling stroke right out to day two after the procedure, which, which is more difficult to interpret. So I think this has raised several questions, and, and hopefully these will be answered by the uh, second study that you will all know about, the BHF Protect TAVI study. This is sponsored by the British Heart Foundation, run by Raj Karbanda, and this uh, uses a similar trial design, uh, also has a similar primary outcome measure, but the definition of stroke is slightly different. It's currently uh, randomized 3248 patients of the 7730 uh, that are aimed for in 30 UK centres. And there's no suggestion at the moment that the results of protected TAVA have influenced the recruitment rate. Uh, and there is already a patient level um, prospective meta analysis plan to combine the data. So we'll have more than 10,000 patients to try and answer this important question. So my own perspectives are that the data certainly seems to show, not only in the imaging studies, but in, in protected TAVA, a trend to protection. But it's important to emphasize there is no significant clinical endpoint that has been demonstrated convincingly. It's also worth realizing that the device is very easy to use. The Sentinel is successful in 95% of patients in protected TAVA with a low complication rate. For my personal practice, I will continue to randomize to protect TAVI, and I very much uh, await the, out, uh, the outcome of that study and the combined analysis with interest. And I look forward to discussing this now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Phil, a great overview. Very important topic, very hot topic. I'm sure there is some interaction uh, from the participants. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, <laughs> this is about HALT, or what we call subclinical bleed thrombosis. Do we have any data on, uh, from, from the Agra platform about this? I maybe rephrase this question a little bit. Do we believe this imaging finding of subclinical bleed thrombosis or HALT have any clinical impact for the patient? So, I mean, I, I, it would be strange that it didn't have a clinical impact. I mean, there has been data in recent years that have shown an increased stroke risk in patients with, with HALT and leaflet thrombosis. Um, I don't think we know for sure, Lars. I mean, it's something that we don't want to, to see, never mind the stroke risk, but also the early degeneration of the valve as well. Um, but uh, I, I think that the precise clinical impact of, of this leaflet thrombosis is, is yeah. uh, unclear at the moment. And I also think, what, 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 as I see it, it's, it's a very difficult thing to talk about because it's a snapshot. If you study the same patient a few months later, it's going to disappear by itself or yeah. will, will develop in other patients. So yeah, and I, I think we've probably always had it. I think we just didn't see T-scan patients with surgical bioprostheses. I think if 15, 20 years ago we had done that, we would have seen it on surgical bioprostheses as well. I don't think it's unique to, to the TAVI population. Yeah. yeah, getting back to the stroke dilemma. Um, I mean, you mentioned there are some differences between um, Protect the TAVR and BHF Protect yeah. TAVI in, in the study design. Could you just maybe highlight the most important differences? I think, yeah, so the most, I think the most important is the definition of stroke. And, I, and my interpretation of that late stroke might be that strokes aren't recognized and there's an initial insult at the time of the TAVI and perhaps the patient's a little bit confused, a little bit, uh, um, a little bit drowsy in the day one post TAVI as a stroke on day two, and that's why you're still getting this, this discrepancy. It's the recognition and definition of stroke. Um, in protected TAVA, I think I'm right in saying that the stroke was evaluated by a, a, a neurological professional, which included neurologists, um, neurological nurses, and neurological fellows. In Protect TAVI, it's a questionnaire which is asked by the research nurses on every day. Uh, and so there just may be subtle differences in the detection of a stroke clinically. This is not, they're not imaging studies. These patients aren't getting a routine brain MRI scan. So, so there just may be, and you know, there have been studies showing that if you look really hard for cognitive impairment and subtle neurological signs, you find more of them. The, the stroke rate is higher, the harder you look. Yeah. So there just may 
I think we're just going to have to interpret that with caution when we, when we get the protect heavy data. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you have, w when we were taking part in protected tower, it was clinically for us an, an easy decision making process. We didn't have to choose which patient to, to get embolic protection, but we were randomizing. Now you have the same advantage in the United Kingdom, but uh, for the others. How did you, for example, how do you digest these um, results, Russia, until we have the outcomes of the larger trial? What do you do for your patients? You can't randomize. Yeah, um, so I, I don't think we have a clear answer as definitely doesn't work because I think we're st it still works in a certain population. What we know from the data is actually the stroke rates are a lot lower than we think. So that's yeah. actually in one way it's good, but um, it doesn't mean that you can protect everyone just by saying it's low. Um, what we don't know yet about the subgroups, we still do it for bicuspid. We still do it for very heavily calcified valve and valve. So uh, I, we need more data just because we subgroup analysis, we cannot draw conclusions based on the protected TAVI. Um, so we, hopefully with the British one, we would have more data. The other, I think my concern is also the, the, the roll-in was a bit different or the patient selection. So uh, in the UK, they're probably going to enroll everyone. So uh, in the US, there's probably a question whether it's commercially available for some patients and not being um, enrolled to, in the beginning of the trial. Yeah, that do, do you have information how, how many patients were actually enrolled in the enrolling centers in the United States. So did they just cherry pick patients or not? Uh, I actually don't know that data, but mm. you know, um, assuming that it's commercially available, there's going to be some inherent bias. So I don't think you'll get to the bottom of the answer. I, I think that's the real concern mm. is that if you see a patient that has huge mobile masses on, your, on the valve or there's some massive concern clinically, operators might think, I'm just going to use the cerebral protection of this patient uh, and not randomize. Or either, you know, there may be a lower um, instance of valve in valve, for example, because operators assume there's a higher stroke risk. So that's the real concern is that the high risk patients will be gently filtered out of these, of these uh, studies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marco, there are some people interpreting the data in a, in a, in a different way. You, you see a reduction in disabling strokes. On the other hand, you see maybe a little bit numerically higher rates of um, non-disabling strokes. So people sometimes interpret this that we're not abolishing stroke, but we're decreasing the severity of stroke. Would you go with this interpretation? Well, this is very, I, th I think it is very speculative. Mm -hmm. um, is. I think we really don't have the, unfortunately, well, thanks God, the events, as you said, they are very low. So I think from a statistical, statistical standpoint, at the moment, it's very tough to drive meaningful conclusions. And I think uh, we are physicians, we are men, so I think it's still up to us to decide according to what we think. Uh, to the pathology, to the physiology of, yeah. of the patient, to the age of the patient um, to use, and according to also to the resources of the hospital um, to use a uh, cerebral protection device or not. So actually, I think at the moment um, uh, we cannot trust completely on evidence because it's just low, mm -hmm. just low, uh, low data and it's not really meaningful. So. That's There's a question here from the, from the audience. Um, did the protected TAVA trial change your own clinical practice of using these embolic protection devices? Well, I know you're still in a study, yes, well, so, 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 so I don't Ignatius, <laughs> I would uh, say no. Russia. I, I would say no. no. It didn't change, to be honest. No, because in, in my center or in my practice, we are using just this type of devices in patients that we feel that are at high risk. So uh, we can try to discuss what is high risk, but as Russia said, probably by cuspid, valve in valve, patient that you feel that are high risk. So for me, it didn't change my practice. Yeah. Well, which is actually frustrating because a lot of right. effort uh, has been made in such a trial, but sometimes we have to admit that with such very complex issues, such as stroke, where the, the, the events are low, uh, it's probably tough to get evidences, and I think we should uh, congratulate who's trying to get um, evidence and trying to shed more light on this important and, and, topic. And hopefully the large database of 10,000 patients will identify, yeah. help us identify those patient subgroups that, that uh, need, yeah. need, need yeah. the device. I, I think probably the, the, the single message is this device, this technique should not be used 
in, in all patients. Yeah, yeah. Probably the exactly. only message we can get is this. And there'll Probably be some score system yes. to, to help you. Yeah. 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 If, if I should just say one final comment, this is my personal opinion. I think this, uh, both the protected TAVA and the protected TAVA in the UK are not ideal studies. They, they looked at clinical stroke in hospital. Uh, if you ask a stroke neurologist, he will say these silent brain lesions are not that silent. It's going to put the patient at risk for early dementia, for cognitive yeah. impairment. And I think that also needs to be studied because we're going to move to patients with longer life expectancy. So, so I think the question is more uh, complex than just uh, who actually got a stroke in yeah. hospital. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think the case is not closed for, for the stroke prevention dilemma. And we're to summarize maybe what we currently have. We have big trials, bigger trials are coming. Um, the, uh, the definitive question uh, or the definitive answer is not there yet. Um, and I think we as a community, we still believe that we should be doing something to prevent not only stroke, but cerebral embolization in general, because I think this is something that um, we currently don't have real control upon, uh, and, and this is annoying. So, uh, so to, to, to summarize these aspects, we have a case uh, beautifully done by Ignacio, um, focusing on these aspects uh, that we have discussed, how to optimize management of a patient that has um, a longer life expectancy. Ignacio. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. In the next few minutes, I'm going to present a case we recorded at the University Hospital of Salamanca. These are my disclosure. So it's a 76-year-old active lady with hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity. The patient came to our clinic with shortness of breath and the transthoracic echo, so severe aortic stenosis. So after discussion at the heart, uh, heart team meeting, the decision was made to perform TAVR. You can see here the CT, the aortic annulus was, uh, had a perimeter of 77 millimeters, diameter 24.5 Vascular access was okay for transfemoral tabber. Here you can see in more detail the, the annulus, although you cannot see the numbers probably. The, the maximum diameter was 26, the minimum diameter was 22, and also here you can see the distance from the coronary artery ostia to the annulus. And here you can see in detail the, the, the valve itself, so you can see it's a bicuspid valve with moderate calcification. Also, the CT coronary angiogram describes a soft concentric plaque in mid-LAD. You can see there that there is a severe stenosis. And also, the CT shows us the sizes and the angulation of the supraortic trunks in case that we decide to use a sentinel device. This is the EKG, so the patient was in sinus rhythm. It has an LBB conduction abnormality. Uh, the QRS was 119. So the key points of the case is quite easy. Is a young patient, at least in Spain, 76 for Tabar is a young patient. We have conduction abnormalities. We have coronary disease and is bicuspid. So at that point, we need to decide which Tabar we were planning to use. And we decide to use accurate NEO2. Why? For all these reasons. One is because in young patients, I prefer supraannular valve because the hemodynamics are going to be better, and probably this is going to translate into longer durability. Also, in young patients, I care about pacemaker. So this type of valve, the Acurin Neo2, has low conduction injury. Also, you have low patient prosthesis mismatch. As Marco has just explained, commercial alignment is really, really important for us. So Acurin Neo is quite easy, as you will see in the case, to do commercial alignment. And also, it's easy to get coronary access because of the design of, with an open frame. Also, if we are treating young patients, we need to consider the possibility of tabber in tabber in the future. So it's also that I will consider in this type of patient. Finally, we want to have less PBL as possible. So Acrid Neo, as Russia has just presented, has very low rate of uh, PBL. And also, we want to have an accurate position. So the case strategy, based on this, was initially coronary angiogram, PCI if needed, place sentinel, as we <laughs> have discussed in bicuspid, I feel that is high-risk patient, and TAVR, we use accurate NEO2. 
You should know that 4 by cuspid is an off-label indication, but I feel that the result is, is okay in this type of patient. We use Safari 2, direct pacing over the LB cut wire, the dead target we have discussed also. Our target is what the company recommends, so 5 to 7 millimeters because of the distribution of the radial force, and try to get commercial alignment. So now we will present the case. So Welcome this is the case. to the University Hospital of Salamanca. I'm Dr. Cruz Gonzalez. Here with me is Dr. Diego and Patricia as, as a nurse. Here you can see that there is a tight lesion in the mid LAD. So we are planning to do right now a PCI to mid LAD. Okay. okay. So now we're going to use Sentinel. So we're going to do an autogram just to check the, the position of, of the filters. Right. I think that is correct, both of them. I think we have a just our projection trying. In this case, it's quite difficult because it's by cuspid, but there's like a very little uh, signal. We, we already have our pigtail in the non coronary signals, and probably the right is there. Mm -hmm. And probably this is the best projection that we can have. So now we are going to check the Cus overlap view. We are going to check to use this projection to check especially commissure alignment. I'm sorry. I think it's okay. Right. Okay, we have already crossed. And here is quite important to place the safari wire just at the apex. When you push the wire, the wire is going to move to the outer curve of the aorta. Now we are going to do the valvuloplasty. Mm -hmm. dale, 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 dale. So you put a marca pasos. Okay. So we can review now, but I think we have a very good pre dilatation. You can see uh, the calcium, but I think that it should be enough for the implantation of, of the valve. So now what we are going to do, you can, it's going to be a three step. So I push here, push again, and I have everything in place. And now I will advance like 10 centimeters and I can take out this. Vale, ya puedes quitar. Vale. Eh, es un momentito solo. Para que se vea que está avanzando a las seis. So as you can see here, we are advancing with the flash port at six. You see there? And now we are going to check the position, but in order to check the position, you should do this at the level of the annulus. It makes no sense to make the alignment just here in the ascending aorta. We need to do it just here at the level of the annulus, something like that. I think that we can see the three poles, okay? See one. See, see. see. So I'm just advancing a little bit more. I have the picture in position. I'm going to advance just a little bit more so that it is to see the marker just at the level of the pigtail. And I think that we can see the three markers there, right? So I, I see the three posts. So sometimes you can see the configuration 2, 1, 1, 2, or the three posts. I think that here we are almost in the three post view, and we will check here in the Kush overlap that the pin, you can see here the pin is on the right, so we are exactly as we want to see. So here you can see two, two posts in the same plane and another one in the other plane with the pin pointing to the right, so I think we are okay to go. I think that the wire is at the apex, you can see there, yeah, it's at the apex, so when I push, everything is in the outer part of the curve. In Untes, when it's quite important to check that the that the big tail bounce around is all the way down. So you can see that it's not all the way down, it's just like one or two millimeter above that. And the idea with this valve is to advance and to have the marker just at the level of the distal part of the big tail. A little bit more because here, as you have just seen, the big tail was not all the way down. Vamos a grabar aquí. What do you think there? Yeah, I like it there. So, 
uh, I think it's quite stable here. The last movement is push that is different from other valves. So here we need to keep tension because of that is quite important, quite important to have the wire in a good position. We know in this, for this valve, we are not using a pacing for, for deployment because I think it's quite stable there. So we have two positions. So this is one, this is two. First, we are going to rotate one to deploy the initial part of the valve. And after that, we will need to take out this safety button in order to go with the, with the two. So we are going to do one. Vale, rápido. So I'm just keeping the position with some tension. And you can see that we have the, the arc there. You can check again the position. Again, no? So, so what is important here to see is that we have just the, the distal marker at the level of the pigtail and the upper crown is just dropping the leaflets, you can see there. So I think we are in a good position. It's quite important here just to keep the, the tension. And also here, we can discuss later the idea, is just to place the valve like that. It's not like in other valve that we want to implant as high as possible. Here, it should be at that position. With five, seven millimeters, we are going to be perfect there. So I'm just keeping some tension, and we will take out the safety button, please, Capitano. And now we will go with two, rápido. Let's go with two. Okay, so I think we have a good expansion. And I think that we have a, a very good position. Yeah. I'm just adjusting, okay. espera, espera. So in order to take out the ball, we need to push, pull the wire just to center the ball just at the middle just at the middle of the um, of the ball because we don't want to trap the delivery system into the distal frame so now alejandro is pulling no vete empujando guía vale and we are taking out vale ahí vale good vale and now we are going to do uh, we are going to, to recapture the, the delivery system, so we are going to move two. Hello, Trump. And now one. So we are going to take everything out. We will keep the wire in place. Just in case we need to do port dilatation, also we have decided to, to leave the pigtail in that position just as a marker, but we will do now another injection, but we are going to pull the pigtail using a wire just to prevent the dropping of the, the dropping of the pigtail with the arcs of the valve. I think that the position is really good. Also the patient is totally stable. So I'm just advancing a wire and just pulling the pigtail so we are going to do our first injection here, and after that, we will try to make an injection without the wire. You can see also that the QRS is still narrow and the hemodynamics are, are okay. I really like the, the results. So you can see there's there's no leak. We have a lot of space to get into the, the coronaries. So you can see pressure now. It's no gradient. No significant grain at all. So I think we are we are done with. So we have no grading, we have no leak. The QRS is still is still narrow. And we are going to try to get coronary access. And with this, we will finish the, the case. We are going to use the EBU catheter, the one that we used before. So it's six frames, 3.5. And here you have two possibilities. One is out, go out of the of the arc because we have enough space or we can cross through here in this case you have no cells so just see nice it was just to show how easy it was to cross and that's it in patient like this young patient especially they they have coronary disease we need we need to make a good decision about which is the, the tower that we are going to use. I feel that accurate is an ideal choice for this type of patient because you have a low pacemaker rate, 
you have low PBL and quite easy to get commercial alignment and coronary access. Also, in this type of young patient, I really feel that we need to focus on hemodynamics, so I will choose a supraannular valve. And finally, in case that this patient needs in the future a new valve, you can place an intraannular valve like the Edwards, and you will still have coronary access. Hey, great. So, so uh, uh, Ignacio, there's just one question here from Jorgens regarding the procedure. Do you need to rapid pace during valve deployment? So, in, in most of the cases, I know do rapid pacing. I, it really depends if the, if the valve is stable. As you can see here, there was no movement, the wire was in a good position. I don't, I'm not doing rapid pacing. In case that I feel that the valve is not stable, is moving at all, I don't care to do rapid pacing, not really rapid, I mean around 130, 140, we can do that. But in this case, I, I felt that it was quite stable. So uh, impressive outcome actually in this, actually very difficult uh, by cuspid anatomy. I'm sure, I personally, I don't have a big experience with the, with the accurate platform and by cuspids. I'm sure that a lot of participants would be interested on your insights. How many of these procedures did you perform and are there certain selection criteria for this platform and bicuspid valves? I mean, of course, I have not very, very large experience in bicuspid with, with Acura. We have some little, little registries showing that you can get good results with Acura, with Acura Neo in bicuspid valves. So there's an, from the Italian group, there's one, there's little numbers, but in all of them it's consistent that you can, it's safe and feasible. Of course, there are a lot of different types of bicuspid. In this case, although I have not presented all, all the slides, we have something, it was, um, uh, it was the, the virtual rave ring and the virtual uh, basal ring was the same, so it was codominant. So in this type of codomina, I feel quite comfortable using this type of valves. I'm talking about self-expandable valve because probably they are going to be able to accommodate. The risk of rupture is going to be less. And probably especially in, with Acurin Neo, the risk of PBL is going to be less. So because of that, in that type specific of morphology for my cuspid, I feel quite comfortable using self-expandable valves. I think this is important that, that we understand the different phenotypes and we are starting to understand which uh, prothesis type would fit into the best anatomical phenotype. Um, post dilatation, how often do you need to do this in bicuspids? You didn't do it in this case, you didn't need it, correct? Yeah. But any concerns about frame expansion? So you, do you do it to obtain better frame expansion or you just uh, depend uh, on mean, the hemodynamics? Yeah, I mean, you see that in this case it was easy to take that decision. I mean, there was no PBL, there was good expansion, the hemodynamics were good. So it doesn't make sense to do post dilatation, but I agree that in case that you have some doubts, I will be more aggressive in post dilatation in bicuspid just to get a good result that in, we can say, tricuspid valves. So uh, in, we can say that, not in this case, but in most of the cases, I will consider post-dilatation in case that I see that the frame is not totally expanded. Lars, what's, what's your take on that? I mean, you showed us images before showing how under-expanded these valves may look like in bicuspid anatomy. Is this something that should be concerning or not? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think it's important to try to get a circular, as circular strain frame as possible. Of course, you have to respect if it's a very calcified autogenous in a bicuspid autogenous valve. If you're too aggressive, you, you have the risk of an anus rupture, of, and which you, of course, don't want. We were talking about subclinical leaflet thrombosis before a halt, uh, and we also know the less constrained the stain frame is, the, the smaller is the risk that you actually got uh, subclinical leaflet thrombosis. Valves which have a super leaflet position, the stain frame seems to be more circular where the leaflet is actually mounted. So despite it's quite constrained or elliptical at the anus level, it's often going to be circular where the leaflets are and, and thereby have a smaller risk of uh, subclinical leaflet thrombosis. You can say, what about durability and so on? So I think it's, uh, it's important to try to bring this uh, stain frame to a circular configuration where the leaflets are mounted, especially if you have an internal leaflet position. Yeah, I, I think this is important when we're trying to under, or we're going to understand the impact uh, on durability in the future as well. Um, you did alignment. Um, 
in a bicuspid anatomy, do we should, should we do in commissure alignment or coronary alignment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, we should talk uh, probably in this case about coronary alignment. In the CT, in the annulus, you can see that the configuration of the origin of the, of the artery was, was normal. So uh, you need to align the bulb to get coronary access, especially in this type of patient. As, as you have seen, it was quite easy to get access because uh, regarding Marco's comment before, I feel that even in centers with not large experience, we should focus on coronary alignment because especially with accurate news, quite easy. I mean, you have the marker, you have the pin, so it's not such a big deal. I mean, I totally agree if it's totus and you need to rotate, sometimes may maybe doesn't make sense, but our first steps to do go with the pin at six and try to get it there because in most of the cases you are going to have probably in 80 percent of the cases you are going to get perfect alignment without any kind of rotation so in this case as you see there was like a small sinus so although it was of course it was not a three cast because it was supposed not to have three cast but you can see something just to align there so maybe one final question um, i don't know if you want to support this with a slide or something about redo procedures with the accurate platform? Yeah, we, we can show the, the slide because that's something that now we are taking into account when we are treating young patients. We need to have coronary access and we should consider that maybe in the future, we're talking about 10, 15 years, maybe you need another valve in valve tab in tower. So if you can have my, my slides. There, there. Ah, there, sorry. So I just want to share with you, this is how we see uh, is to get coronary access in case that you have good commercial alignment. And this is a 3D modeling of the case that I have just presented. This is something that the company provides us. So here you can see that we finally were able to achieve that position with the bulb just advancing at, with the pin at, uh, at six and how easy it was to get coronary, coronary access. And here is also a reconstruction. It's a 3D modeling using this software just to know or to anticipate if we need to do another valve in valve, tower in tower, review using an intraannular valve that the Sapien Edwards, you will be still having access to coronary. So I think this is quite important, especially if we are treating younger patients right now. Yeah, very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, Mohammed, we, we came to the end of this session. So. This year is 20 years since we saw the first TAVI performed in a human being back in 2002. It's been an amazing journey. It's been an paradigm shift in, the, in treating patients with aortic stenosis, but also to see how the ambition has changed over the, line, over the time. In the beginning, everyone was happy about having a safe procedure in the cat lab, valve in place, patient home. Now, everyone is aiming for, for the perfect. We have seen that operator skills have in, in, improved pre-procedural planning, new generation devices is coming out. We talked about treating patients with longer life expectancy. We need valves with good durability, possibility for revalving later on, low rate of permanent pacemaker, low rate of parvalvular leak, easy access to the coronary arteries and so on. And I think this session hopefully touched on some of these uh, subjects here and also how you can actually gain that in your daily clinical practice. So thank you, uh, Mohammed, for, for being the anchor person of this session. Ignacio, Rasha, Marco, and Phil, and for you attending here. So I hope you to see you for the last few sessions at this PCR London Valve this afternoon. Thank you.